have any questions for Loy, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registra registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Loy. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, yes, yeah, so again, we are going to uh, talk about uh, practical challenges that a lot of our customers run into when they're implementing micro-segmentation. So just a quick bit about me. My name is Loy Evans. As Carol mentioned, I'm a technical solutions architect. I live just a little north of New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, home of Mardi Gras. Uh, and I have been uh, in the industry for 26 years, which means that I cut my teeth on things like uh, BNC connectors, Network 311, uh, some very early 3Com 10 megabit hubs, uh, half duplex, of course. Uh, and I, I, I do not have video today. One of the main reasons why is I have been married for 22 years. I have an awesome wife and two awesome kids, and all of them are here today taking classes and working from home with all of the stuff that's going on. So unfortunately, uh, actually really probably fortunately for you guys, you will not have to look at me while I present. Uh, but I do show that my kids to show that uh, they're awesome kids, but they do get a little bit of their, uh, their uh, uh, fun nature from me as well. Okay, so agenda-wise, we're going to talk a little bit about what micro-segmentation is. We're going to talk about why we segment or why we micro-segment, and that'll make a little bit more sense and a little bit why I put that in parentheses. Then we'll talk about segmentation in the real world, how we go or how do we enforce the segmentation, then kind of how we get started and where we get started, and talk a little bit about the policy problem and what, and, uh, what we have to do in order to get the right policy. Then we'll wrap up with a summary, and then uh, if there's any questions in the panel, I will actually handle those as much as I can live at the end. If I'm not able to get to all of the questions, the SANS Institute will provide me with the questions, and I will provide the answers. And the goal is to have all of those things uh, available for you with the slides and the recording later. So let's get started. So what is microsegmentation? Well, basically, microsegmentation is a method of restricting communications between resources based on some different factors, such as you know what they are and what they're doing. Enforcing that as close as possible to the resource it's uh, being protected and it's re being re uh, enforced regardless of the network or environment that that resource lives on. Now, just a quick quote from me. One does not wave a magic wand and microsegment the world. And this is actually going to be something that we're going to spend a little bit of time on later. So why do we do segmentation or micro-segmentation? So the not good news is, is that uh, in the uh, past uh, 18 months to two years, uh, it, it has only gotten more and more frequent that we see headlines that talk about a business being breached and losing data, uh, losing credit card numbers, you know, a lot of different things. And, it's, and the thing is, is that that the, the uh, attacks and the frequency of attacks, they're not slowing down. So this is something that continually uh, becomes a need. Well, one of the things that is actually quite interesting is every one of the customers that have been breached, they all had these typical things in common. They all had firewalls, IPS, IDS, uh, uh, data loss protection, uh, operations, security operations centers, patch management. They have all of these things in place, but these things are still happening. And one of the reasons why is that if, a, if an attacker looks at the modern application environment with the data centers and cloud environments and uh, different types of deployments and you know, legacy systems and new uh, microservices and things like that, it's an easy target environment. There's, in, in almost any case, even if there's patch management in place, a lot of times what happens is you end up with uh, change management that actually causes problems with applying patches or things of that nature. There's, uh, um, there's uh, linkages in, in libraries that cause us to have to roll patches back, things like that. So we end up in a lot of cases with hundreds of unpatched software packages running on thousands of different endpoints, which uh, really kind of doesn't help when we have our traditional legacy protection methodologies in place. And so that makes for a very easy capability for an attacker to get in and easily move laterally within the within and between zones. This is, in a lot of cases, kind of considered the, the typical environment where you've got the hard, crunchy shell, but the soft, gooey center. And that's one of the things that micro-segmentation is built to fix. Uh, 
So if we look at what you know, a lot of times happens is that you know, when there's an attack, this can be something that actually can be a legitimate service that's being offered via web service to the public internet, but maybe some unpatched software happens to be there that allows direct root access that allows then an attacker to move laterally internally. This is one of the ways in which the Apache struts vulnerability gained such a, a fa a fame in the last couple of years. Uh, we've also seen where you've got, like, say, contractors or contract developers that have access to a lot of high-value high systems that maybe they click on an email that actually launches some sort of rootkit or some sort of malware. Uh, we also have things like IoT devices that happen to live inside of our internal network that, again, unless we have very good internal movement protections, those things have a very easy mechanism for getting, uh, uh, giving someone access to our network and having them get access to anything that they need of privilege. So it makes, again, for a very easy target environment. And the reason why we know this is things like ransomware <clears throat> that we have seen in, in the, 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 uh, in the world running rampant uh, over the, the recent past. As a matter of fact, uh, in 2019, as recent as 2019 in October, the FBI put out a public service announcement about ransomware and some of the ways in which you can address this, configuring access controls with least privilege, implement physical and logical separation of networks and data. What's interesting is, this almost this exact same uh, note came out from the FBI in a PSA about ransomware in 2016, which proves that the protection mechanisms really are not being done. And they're really not being done because it's actually really kind of hard to do. So let's talk a little bit about what segmentation looks like. So a lot of times what people think is if we're going to segment, let's just throw in a firewall. Well, the problem is, is that when we really talk about doing that in the real world, this is actually what we end up dealing with. We've got our typical campus networks, which may have, have a firewall. Then when we start looking at our data center and cloud and environments where our applications live, we may have data center firewalls that sit between our campus environments and like say our VMware uh, as, uh, assets. Well, it's very common where we see VMware, we also th see things like Hyper-V. Sometimes we see things like KVM. You also have physical servers that are actually um, running in these environments. We also see a lot of legacy systems such as mainframes or um, mini computers, AIX systems, stuff like that. And almost every single customer also has application resources that are running in one or more cloud properties, such as AWS or Azure, Google Compute, stuff like that. And then you also have to consider that we've got this kind of modern uh, application development and deployment type of environment where we're actually doing uh, microservices on containers. Well, if you look at all of those different types of things, how do we enforce segmentation across all of those things? So let's take the most common segmentation thing that I talked about before, which is putting a firewall in. A lot of people do that just kind of thinking, hey, that's the easiest way to do it. But the problem is that really is some, some flawed thinking when you start looking into how do, I, how do I do much more advanced protection mechanisms such as micro-segmentation. Firewalls actually work really, really well when we start talking about putting them at an edge or a border where we have a natural segmentation, uh, or excuse me, a natural segment between two different um, uh, VLANs or two different networks. The problem is, is that when you start looking at trying to protect for lateral movement and uh, get the lateral protection in place, we end up with a challenge because let's say between two machines that sit behind a firewall, they sit on the same subnet or on the same VLAN. How do you actually get a firewall to inject itself inside of that, especially when you start looking at doing this across a bunch of different applications with a lot of different endpoints? What this does is this significantly increases the complexity of the network, and the increased complexity of a network can also directly uh, dictate the fragility of making changes and uh, making things work especially when you start looking at taking this and scaling it out. I tried doing, uh, actually doing an illustration of this for all of those things, and to be truthful, after I did just a single one of them, I didn't want to do it anymore. So you can imagine what things like this look like when you're actually doing network in motion in a production environment that may have 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, maybe even 15 or 20,000 VMs or, or physical servers. The complexity gets really immense. So if we do decide that we're going to go and put the, uh, the, some firewalls in our data center, uh, okay, so then the question becomes, how many are we going to put in there? Do we do just physical? Do we do virtual? Do we do both? 
where do we actually place all of these appliances? And what are we going to do as far as licensing goes? Right? Are we going to actually do you know, box by box licensing for every single thing or not? Do we have the scale to handle the traffic for something that goes into an aggregation or a choke point? Uh, do we actually have the ability to scale our people and our processes to manage all of this? As far as management goes, how do we manage things on this? How do we manage the policy and keep it in sync across all of that? As we're talking about it, what is the right policy to enforce on all of these firewalls? And how do I put the right policy into the right place? So these are the kind of things that, that a lot of uh, customers are running into when they try to think through how they do this. So let's take it and kind of take one step farther and say, all right, well, instead of doing physical firewalls, let's actually talk about how we would do something with some platform dependent controls. We may end up with a bunch of different uh, discrete environments within our, uh, our um, uh, or excuse me, discrete deployments within our environment that we have to look at and see, okay, if I'm going to use that platform to do some protection, what do I do with it? Do I actually choose only one of our hypervisors? Well, if I choose that I'm going to go put effort into one of our hypervisor um, uh, distributed firewalls, uh, okay, well then what do I do for, say, our cloud environments, right? Do I, what do I do for our container environments? Uh, if I have another hypervisor, how do I reconcile between those? So do I go write a bunch of automation that manages the, the, um, the policy for all, just one of those? Do I write separate automation for every single one of the platforms? Or do I try to write some sort of a God script that I can do automation for every single thing all at once? Uh, okay, let's then look at maybe from our container environment. Uh, so our developers can uh, you know, create a, an environment where when they deploy an application, they put the policy in. Well, how can we know that they're going to put in, whether it be on accident or on purpose, incorrect policy? So do we actually trust them with 100% uh, of the policy that's going to attach to the applications that they're rolling with? What about the cloud native controls? If we want to deploy something into Azure or AWS, go back to that, the automation, do we want to write something to the native controls for one or the other? Or again, do we want to roll that all up into one really, really large, very cumbersome type of automation? Well, the issues that we run into with the platform dependent controls is that you normally end up with different uh, platform groups that can lend itself to platform silos for policy management and policy enforcement. You may have the VMware group that wants to go about it one way and maybe a, a Kubernetes group or the development group that wants to do it a different way. You may have a cloud team or even within the cloud team, you may have an Azure team and an AWS team. How do you keep the policy in sync across all of these different things? And then we still fall back to that really big burning question is, what's the right policy to put where? So then we go and say, all right, well, if the platform is not necessarily the right place and the firewall may not be the right place, where's another place that we could actually put this? So we've actually seen in a lot of cases that host-based firewalls is something that has become a, a much more efficient way of doing things. And many operating systems have native controls, such as IP tables, Windows firewall, IP filters, um, some uh, kind of the newer work that's being done with eBPF. Uh, they, these can give us the ability to do very efficient layer three, layer four firewalling, but it does not necessarily give us the ability to kind of climb the stack. <clears throat> There is some work being done with uh, some of the more uh, recent developments, such as some of the stuff being done with eBPF to get a little bit higher in the stack. But if you need to do deep packet inspection of something, the host-based firewalls are typically not the right place to look at that. But if we do use these, it does lend itself to one thing that we've had an issue with that I've been talking about is consistent enforcement across multiple different deployment environments. If we look at host-based, it's actually a lot easier for us to manage consistently across a single cloud environment, an on-prem data center environment, bare metal, VM, containers, uh, even if we scale this into multiple clouds and, and or do application deployments within a hyper cloud. The, the one catch that we actually run into <clears throat> with this is that not every operating system has a firewall that we can instrument with that. So then you know, we kind of you know, jump into some of the negatives, which you know, is very similar to our platform dependent, is when we look at host-based firewall capabilities, it also could lead itself into domain-based silos, right? where maybe the Windows guys you know, only manage the Windows environment and then Linux guys only manage Linux, et cetera. And so you can end up, again, with a, se a separation of what the policy management and policy enforcement looks like for um, more of those.
The other thing is, is that automation and orchestration can be a very, very challenging thing and often can become a showstopper. Uh, if anybody on this call has ever tried to manage Windows firewall through GPOs, uh, my guess is that most of you would probably raise your hand as to whether you would prefer to do that or stick a, start, a sharp stick in your eye. I know I would rather this is a sharp stick. Uh, or for our Linux guys, you may have somebody that says, oh, I'm just, I can just write a bash script. So just imagine writing a bash script that can dynamically manage policy across 10,000 VMs where uh, the population of VMs and their functionality and their IP addresses change on a regular basis based on application scaling up and down. That's not something that, again, is really something that's a, a scalable solution that can be supportable. So then the question comes back to, again, what's the right policy and how do we enforce it in the right place? So where do we do the enforcement? It does depend on a number of factors, right? And you'll have to take into account things like what is supported for the environment? Can you do host-based or is it something that can't support an operating system-based control? Are there any regulatory requirements that require a certain type of protection, such as stateful versus stateless, especially when you start talking about regula uh, regulated environments like PCI? What about the volume of the traffic that you expect or the rate of change, which is actually a very, very interesting thing when you start looking at how you do automation? Are, they, are the endpoints that you're exposing uh, or that you're protecting, are they exposed to the internet and therefore uh, potential DDoS targets? How granular of a policy do I need to go? Do I need to go all the way down to micro segmentation or can I actually do something a little bit less? Do I need a change request for every single change? And if I do, what kind of impact does that have? Does a single change request impact 30 different groups or only one single application? So these are the types of things that we, we actually run into. And so what we've seen is the most efficient, if you can manage the automation, is to take the whole problem, break it up into its atomic elements, and make each resp uh, element responsible for its part. So if we take it in an example, let's say that you have to implement a thousand lines of policy across a hundred VMs. You can put a thousand into a firewall. You can actually break it up and do it into a, a uh, platform based where maybe you have two by 500 or four by 250. Or you can actually go in and say, all right, we're going to go ahead and give the work of protecting each of these uh, assets to the asset itself. And we use the minimum set of policy that those things need to protect themselves. So basically what you're doing is you're taking a very large problem that normally we try to solve all in one single place or in a few places with an aggregation point, And we take it and say, okay, let's break it all down into the smallest pieces possible and make those things do their work for us. So enforcing on the host is what we've seen, one of the most scalable and uh, complete ways of enforcing if you can manage the automation. Well, if you can manage the automation, and if we can assume, yes, that enforcing on the host is the most scalable complete, there's some things that we still have to worry about, things like defense in depth, right? We don't necessarily want to rely on just one single thing for protection of everything. Oh, and remember I talked about the fact that not every operating system has a firewall. I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure that uh, within the audience, we probably have 50 to 60 percent of, of everybody on this call that has a mainframe or some sort of legacy system in place in their environment. So then can we enforce this policy that we need to enforce on every single one of these things all at the same time? Can we keep those policies in sync on all of these things? Well, what would be really great, an ideal solution would be if we have the ability to manage that policy through some sort of an open policy engine that basically allows us to understand and manage the policy as well as push that out for synchronization to external systems and some automation that works with it. That would be the most ideal solution. So we are going to come back to a little bit of this in, in uh, a later section, but just kind of keep in mind that this is really what we want to try to get to for an ideal solution. So then how do we get started moving down the road of micro segmentation? So we have to define a mental starting line. First thing that you have to do is kind of define your targets. Now around those targets, you have to define what your business goals are. For those business goals, we have to define what our risks are and what kind of risk acceptance we can actually take with how we actually treat those different targets against our business goals. Then the best thing to do is define what our context is that would help us understand a little bit of the story behind what these targets are and what sources of context can we trust? Can we trust information from our CMDB? 
Can we trust information from, say, our deployment systems where we're actually doing uh, dynamic workload tagging or something like that? So the first thing that we have to try to understand is what the right policy is. The second thing we want to understand is what is the right policy. The third thing to understand is, as I said earlier, there is no magic wand. The number one problem that we see for every single customer that's doing micro-segmentation is that they try to do it all in one single attempt, one single try, one single shot to get from zero to micro-segmentation. And I can tell you, as I stand here on this uh, virtual stage, you are guaranteed to fail, you're guaranteed to have to roll it back, and I'm nearly gonna guarantee that you'll have to end up in going into a 12-step program to deal with the fallout. So segmentation, especially micro-segmentation, is a journey. That's the reason why I put the parentheses around micro, micro in the micro-segmentation. Our goal is to try to get to micro-segmentation, but we really look at it as a journey that actually has many uh, stops along the way that each stop can provide us with a significant amount of value. So let's look at this and how we would approach this with a phased approach. So step one is we can actually consider doing something like zone-based segmentation, which is we take a whole bunch of assets and resources that may have a perimeter firewall that sits in front or around them. Uh, and then what we want to do is we want to try to take this and use some context to help us draw a border around specific things where we want to define some policy. As an example, maybe this is a group of development, test, and production machines, and what we want to do is define a simple policy. It says, dev cannot talk to, uh, excuse me, prod cannot talk to dev or test, and vice versa. So when we have the understanding of the context that allows us to actually go in and create a policy set that matches to that. Now we'll get into a little bit more details of how we do that in a bit. The next step would be, okay, we have our zone-based policies in place, so we have a good understanding of things like dev, test, and prod, but then we want to go in and maybe draw some smaller fences around individual applications. So within production, we want to define what's our CRM, what's our ERP, what's our customer catalog, things like that and then do some protection mechanisms where we're drawing our fence and putting some borders around the application itself. Now, this still is not necessarily micro-segmentation, depends on how large your applications are, but this is, again, another step where we can actually get more secure and work our way towards micro-segmentation. So if we take that and say, all right, now we've got our application-based borders in place, now we can take this and actually start moving our way towards pure micro-segmentation, which is, we take the context that we have around the applications and then we apply some deeper level knowledge of the individual components that are a part of that application and we say okay now that we understand what the individual components are for that application and we understand by watching what the communication patterns are within there then we can go in and apply a policy set against each one of those to protect each one on itself. So this is really where we start getting into uh, the benefits of doing things like host-based firewalls. So we'll come back to that in a little bit and show you some examples of how we, how we might do that. But the first thing that we really need to talk about is the policy problem. Because I've mentioned it multiple times, the biggest issue is that we don't necessarily understand the, the policy. Segmentation is not the problem. It's actually the goal. We need to get to where we understand what the policy is. So we need to understand things like What's communicating? How is it communicating? When and why is it communicating? How can we tie this to some sort of context? How do we discover what that communication is? How do we verify what that communication is? And then if we have scale, uh, applications that scale up and scale down, how do we manage the in-state changes, or I should say the in-state changes, when something changes? So how do, we do all, how, we, how do we handle all that stuff? The next thing is, as we discussed, how and where do we actually go and do the enforcement based on where we learn about where the policy should be? So really when it comes down to it, policy lifecycle management is actually the real problem. How we have actually tried to handle this in the past is through some very manual approaches where we go in and do manual identification and tagging of every endpoint within the network, which really falls apart as soon as an application scales up or scales down. We try to capture the network behavior through things like spans and taps, logs, uh, you know, things like that. The problem is, is almost as soon as we capture that, that could very easily be stale data. Again, going back to, let's say that we scale up and scale down on a network that does dynamic IP allocation. The thing that's actually communicating on IPX today may be on IPY tomorrow. 
Well, we take all that stuff and we're still taking that and putting it into things like spreadsheets and doing manual analysis of the data, which does sell, it requires a whole lot of manual correlation and things like spreadsheets, log analysis. Uh, it also ends up in, uh, requiring a whole lot of coffee, which then actually creates a whole lot of jitters, which then makes it you know, a whole lot more mistakes. But we do end up with something that ends up with that being a policy that we think we can count on. Well, even if we could count on that policy, the deployment process is actually where this whole thing takes another turn. Especially, it, depend, or it especially depends on the type of automation that we have and the ability to take the data and make it useful and usable. Well, if we take that data and we put it into something that is a traditional environment, like taking uh, ACLs, putting them into firewalls, that's normally a fairly static environment that is somewhat inflexible. Uh, and if we're doing micro segmentation, directly leads to much more complex network environments that make things a lot more fragile. The other thing is, as I mentioned, scaling up and scaling down means that we end up having what are called non-finite artifacts where, okay, today, the application server that uh, is part of the scale group, maybe it was in AWS and it had one IP address. Tomorrow, maybe it's in Azure and it has a different address, or maybe it's on-prem and it's actually got a completely different set of addresses on a different subnet. The whole thing is very manual, very uh, highly error-prone, never going to be scalable or efficient, especially when you start looking at what some of our customers are dealing with, which is billions of flows. Uh, and I will tell you, if somebody were to tell me that I need to take this flow set, put it into a spreadsheet and figure out how to do a uh, pivot table to figure out what application is talking to what, that's the day that I go ahead and pack it up and become a Walmart greeter. So that's not for me. So then how do we understand what the right policy is? Well, the right policy should be as close as possible to 100%. Now, the problem is that we can't always do that, so we want to get as close as we can, right? Well, how do we do that we, without stopping progress, right? We need to be accurate, but we also need to be flexible, which is a very big uh, challenge to do correctly. So then it really comes down to we need to have accurate data. But more importantly, we need that accurate, da accurate data to have context. But we also have to have the context of that accurate data in the time frame that it matters. So accurate data, context, and timing are all very big uh, parts of this. So then we take all of that stuff and we need to figure out how we use it. Well, then we can actually start doing things like, okay, let's start off with a declarative policy. So we can state, I don't want production to talk to non-production. Then we can rely on the data to actually determine for us which things map into what's production and what's not. Well, that policy that we need to do once we start getting past just the pure stated is actually going to get us closer to microsegmentation, and that's something that we can learn if we have a system in place to do that. So if we can learn from observed communications, that actually helps us get a lot closer to fully microsegmented applications. So let's go back to our phased approach and look at how we might be able to apply this. So we talked a little bit about our zone-based example where we go from no segmentation internally, just using perimeter firewalls at the edge, to we want to protect these different things. One of the things that we can do is we can rely on contextual information. In this particular case, maybe we've got, uh, let's say, some sort of a system of record that helps us understand what uh, the system is. You know, we could do something really, really simple, such as what's the host name of this system? Uh, and then have that reported to us on a regular basis based on automatic integration. So we can actually know, okay, today what's in prod is these 500 machines. Tomorrow it's these 510. The next day it's these 450. The day after that, these, next 100, next, or these, uh, these 600 machines. But as long as we're continually monitoring what is actually referenced by that, we can automatically create a policy set that makes sense for that. And we can take it and extend it out to what's in test and what's in development. It all comes from a tag system that helps us understand the context and how to apply that to something that's real. Well, let's take that and extend it one step farther. So we've already got our zone-based protection systems in place, uh, or excuse me, zone-based zone -based protection policy in place. Now we want to go take one step farther. So if we take this and say, all right, now we know what's in prod, dev, and test. Now let's get one step deeper and get a little bit more information, maybe uh, from our ERP, excuse me, from our CRM, excuse me, 
try that again, from our CMDB system. And maybe from that, we can actually get some detail on, okay, what are the things that actually live inside of my production ERP and production CRM system? And then we can watch that and see, okay, the communication between these, maybe it's got database synchronization between the two. We've actually got it to where we can see, okay, between these two things, this is the type of communication that we need. So then we can apply for prod ERP and prod CRM. Here's the acceptable policy between the two things. And then we rely on the context that we use in order to keep that up to date. Well, we can, we can take that and we can apply it to all of the other different types of applications. But again, what we're doing here is the next step forward, trying to get as close as possible to micro-segmentation. So then we take this and say, okay, now let's swing the pendulum to the complete other side. Now, one thing I will say is that in a lot of cases where we see customers being most successful with this is that they do this uh, on a basically an application by application basis. They don't try to go in internal micro segmentation for every application all at once, right? So again, zone based to application based to micro segmentation, it doesn't have to be all at once, all the time uh, in one shot. So let's take this and say, okay, let's, let's uh, use our context data, get a little bit more information, right? So now it's not just what's in production or what's in the production ERP system. It's what's in the production ERP system and what are the roles of each individual thing. Then we can take that and learn what each individual thing does and see, okay, this is what our, our communication pattern looks like. Maybe we've got uh, you know, a worker node that does application communications to both databases. The databases do some synchronization between them in the cluster. And then maybe we've got a, a batch system that the worker actually says, okay, hey, periodically you're going to run these things. Well, we have all of that information in observed communications. Then we can take that and basically underlay that policy underneath what we've already got from a policy set from our uh, zone-based and our application-based segmentation. And then we basically layer this underneath it to where now we have true micro-segmentation within that application for all of those. So even if we have the, the uh, tried and true issue where we have a vulnerable piece of software and something gets compromised, Typically, what a, an a, um, uh, attacker would actually do with that is once they get on that system, they install their own tool set, and then they actually start the process of doing reconnaissance. Well, if we're enforcing only the minimal set of, of communication that needs to make this application work, typically that attacker is not going to be able to use any of their tooling to learn more about the environment and set us and um, uh, spread to anything else from later, lateral movement. So that really is kind of like how we take this on a phase approach from zero down to micro segmentation. So then the question is, how can we guarantee that the micro segmentation policy that we see is correct? Data, context, and time, and all of them together is really what we need to use in order to do that. So let's kind of walk through a little bit of what that might look like. So we've got a bunch of puzzle pieces, and here's some of what they look like. So first thing we need to start off with is basically, you know, just data in general. But the first thing we want is flow data. Okay, this thing talk to this thing on this port. Well, then we want to bring some context into that and say, okay, so this thing talked to this thing over this port. And the thing that was being talked to on that port is actually listening with this process. So we now know that a, a user communicated uh, to a HTTP service on server, uh, server Y. Well, then we can also go in and rely on some of that user data, that, uh, that tag information. So we actually can then see, okay, this uh, uh, particular machine that is actually servicing HTTPD is a part of one of our SAP applications. So now we actually have a, a very rich set of data that says, on this date, at this time, I saw this thing talking to this thing that's a part of the SAP application, and it's actually running this process and listening on this port. That's a lot of really good information. The problem is, is that now we've got context, flow, and process data that we need to tie together from different sources in different formats. So how do we put all that stuff together and make it usable? So this is a little bit of what the back, uh, back end of a system would look like in order to actually build this. So we take the flow data and do something like, okay, hey, let's take the client side flow data, which is basically the source of the, the communication, match it up to the server side flow data, which is, it's great. However, now we need to look into some more of the detail behind what's really going on. So do flags matter? Absolutely they do. 
if I've got some SIN and SINAC uh, communications, that tells me this is a legit flow. What happens if I were to actually see this, but all I'm doing is collecting, say, NetStat data on a server? I may not know that I've actually tried a SINAC on one side and the server reset it because it was not a legit communication. We want to make sure that we're tracking what's legit and what's not. Now, then we want to tie, as I mentioned before, information behind what's actually being communicated with and what's responding. So do we know what the process is that's running behind the port that's mapped? If it's port 80 and it's HTTPD, that very likely could be a good thing. Um, if that's HC, or excuse me, if that's port 80 and that's a command and control process that we don't recognize, that definitely could be bad. What if it actually has a hash that we could go in and verify, hey, is this something that's a good hash or is this something that's a known bad hash? So are we whitelisting malware without knowing it? So this, you know, another set of process information that we really need to be able to put into the model. Well, the next thing that we want to do is we want to take the context data of who is communicating. So if you look at an IP address within your network, it's very likely that you won't know exactly what that is, especially when you start looking at things like some of the IPv6 addressing, and especially when you're trying to map that to, say, a user community that actually actively logs on and logs off uh, from different, different places and their addresses change. We also want to be able to tell the story within this model of, okay, what is the, the context detail of what the application is doing and where does it live? Is this sitting in data center one or is this sitting in AWS? Can we get information from our CMDB? Does the CMDB give us some extra detail that helps us understand the detail around what's actually going on on that server within this conversation? So now we actually have what we think is a complete puzzle. Now, the problem is, as if we needed another challenge, almost every single application out there has some level of server load balancing technology that's involved. Well, the problem is that SLB devices typically break flows using, uh, because they're using NAT. So if we're trying to map this out and we can't look into the server load balancer, what does this server think that he's talking with? The issue that we, that we see is that a server load balancer basically proxies for the user communication to the server. So the server will basically see the server load balancer acting as a user agent. Well, if we're trying to map out end user to server communication, that really breaks things. So we need to understand that our goal is actually to define user communication with the backend server services. And the magic actually sits inside of the server load balancer. So the goal is to try to take this, get that information out of the server load balancer and put it all together within our model. So now we actually have what basically would uh, uh, be a very complete explanation of a single flow. And again, think about the fact that we're actually talking about this happening across billions of flows. And in very many cases, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of flows every single second, possibly even millions of flows every single second. That is something that is very, very challenging for individuals and humans to do, especially when you're trying to do it with captures and spreadsheets and things like that. Now, once we have that data, what we want to do is actually get something that can use that and tell us a little bit about what's going on within there. So what we would do then is say, okay, hey, let's go in and, and basically say, this is what's in scope. Tell me something about it. Then apply some algorithms to that to say, okay, based on the observations, I have a natural grouping of servers that are clustered together. I have a natural mapping of what those things communicate with when we discover what that policy is. So we can take live data that actually is built <clears throat> around uh, you know, the observations and the context, the time sensitive components to the processes that are running and the communications that they're, uh, they're either terminating or starting to tell us the full story and then map that stuff out and use that as actually a, a proof point that says, okay, this is what we've seen but this is actually the proof behind what we've seen. So it's not just taking a template of, okay, I think that this is an exchange server, so we're gonna take a exchange template and apply it to it and expect that that's, uh, that's correct. One of the things that we've seen with probably 95% of customers out there is if you go with basically just a template-based uh, 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 model, 
almost every single environment has at least one small change or one difference in behavior from the next customer that invalidates a purely template-based model. Now, template-based models can be a good place to start from, so you know, that's not a completely uh, wrong way to do it, but when you really want to get as close to 100% accurate as possible, you need to be able to ingest the data that we're talking about and use that to map the stuff out. So in, in summary, all of this stuff that we've talked about is you know, completely available to anybody, right? As a matter of fact, there are even open source uh, platforms out there, open source tools that you can use for things like flow collection for doing context gathering and context correlation, for policy management, modeling, simulation. You can you know, use Ansible or something like that for automation, for enforcement. But we really think that there should be a system for this. And if there was a system for this, what would it actually include? The characteristics would be you know, a data collection model, uh, a module, a context correlation that automatically pulls in data from multiple different uh, systems out in, in the environment and automatically correlates this on basically you know, a, a very frequent basis so that we've actually got the time-based or the temporal nature of how these communications go and the context around that whole story. We want to use analytics to understand all of that data to be able to discover what that policy should be and get us as close as possible to an accurate representation. Give us the ability to manage that policy, to do you know, validation, modeling, simulation, make sure that it actually is a correct and valid set of policy. Then we take that and actually do the enforcement of that within the same system using native enforcement automation. Now, it would take a very significant effort to build this from scratch. It would use probably all of the possible buzzwords that you could uh, imagine from a big data system. So there's a lot of different things that would have to be put together for this. And the high-level goals of a system like that would basically be ingest the data, collect as much information and context as possible, analyze that and understand it so that it can produce us a set of policies that we can look at and validate. Once we validate, yes, these are the correct things, then we use that to protect the assets that we're concerned with. Once we're protecting that, we want to continually monitor that st uh, those systems against what the expected policy and expected behavior is. Send out alerts whenever we see anything that's out of the ordinary and what doesn't match with what our policy is expected to be. Then we take that and continually gather data so that we are always watching to see, has the application changed? Did things scale up? Did things scale down? Did we actually keep that in sync at all times when we're protecting it? And if we didn't, we wanna make sure that we're monitoring for that and alerting when anything actually drifts at what the expectation is for what the policy and the behavior of the systems is. So we do have a product called Tetration that is built for this. And essentially it works like this. It's a platform approach that takes in the headers of every packet in the data center or cloud property. And it helps us map the context of all the conversations in the data center cloud. It also can bring in things like software vulnerability uh, data, process behavioral data, things of that nature, and map that into that real-time tagging that allows us to have the context of, the, of what's going on. But an output of this is that we can take all of that data and actually use some machine learning algorithms to say, okay, tell me what's actually going on inside this application. From that, we can produce a policy discovery that gives us a, a set of zero trust policies that if we wanted to go all the way to whitelist, this is the prescription for how we actually get to that. Now, we also have the ability to do policy modeling and, and simulation to make sure that that policy set is actually something that's valid. And if we were to go in and implement it, what kind of things would we break? Well, if we go through and we say, okay, everything looks good from that perspective, we have the ability to just do a single push button to do native enforcement on things like the operating system controls and host-based firewalls. But for those places where we can't do that, we also have an open policy that we can do an automatic policy feed out of the system to keep other systems in sync with that uh, enforcement. So back to where, what I was talking about earlier, where we might want to be able to take that policy and use that in multiple places, but we only want to do that if we can keep it all in sync. There is an automatic uh, policy feed that a external system could subscribe to, use some automation to take that and actually keep 100% of the policy in sync across multiple different systems. There's also integrations that are built to take advantage of this with other third-party vendors out in the market that we work with.
Now, while we're doing this, as I mentioned, you want to continually watch the systems as the uh, as they're running to see, okay, you know, what's actually going on? What are the state that we're in? Can we use that to do audits and actually show compliance against an expected policy set? If we happen to see something that is not within compliance, we want to be able to send out alerts and event notifications and even do things like triggered investigations or triggered actions where we can quarantine or protect something that is actually a part of a, uh, you know, an attack or something like that. But then if a vulnerability comes on the market that actually gets uh, publicized by you know, one of the, the um, vulnerability mapping systems, we want to be able to take that data and use that to do some sort of protection. Let's say that you know, another WannaCry or something like that comes out where there's a very specific known set of CVEs that make something susceptible. We want to say, okay, anything that's a part of that, automatically protect that from communications via uh, TCP 445 or something like that. So again, the goal is, is to take a systematic approach to discover the workloads, map the applications and any dependencies, generate the policies that make sense for each individual workload, allow us to validate and verify what that policy is, dynamically enforce that policy wherever it lives, and then do compliance monitoring, auditing, and alerting of what's going on. And the goal here is we want to try to significantly reduce the attack surface reduce the amount of security rule management that has to go into each individual human's lives that are a part of this, which will get us faster to segmentation, and we end up with segmentation projects that don't last years. Uh, I will tell you as a uh, just a quick story, I've got a customer that we started talking to not too long ago that is uh, was working on a, a um, data classification project that they ended up with five tiers of data classification for their applications, tiers zero through four. Well, it just so happened that they started on this project about two years ago, and the goal was just to simply segment tier zero from one, two, three, and four, one from you know, et cetera, et cetera. They wanted to separate all of those, um, those, uh, uh, those tiers. It took them two years just to segment off the tier zero, which is the most secure applications from the rest. They still haven't even done tiers one through four. So it's, this is a real struggle that segmentation projects are very complex and very challenging to get right. And so what we want to try to do is actually get uh, uh, customers as quickly as possible from not doing any segmentation to doing at least some, and then from there moving as close as possible to micro-segmentation. Uh, so we have a little bit of time uh, left. Uh, I, I'm going to handle any questions if we have any, uh, but I also want to take just a second to show you guys just a really quick glimpse into what this looks like from a demo perspective. So I'm going to jump over and show my Tetration uh, cluster and some applications that we have running in there. So the first thing that I'll show you is this is an application, our production invoicing system that I've actually gone in. Now this is in my lab, but this is my production invoicing system that I've learned the policies about. And what it's done is it's produced for me a set of rules that says, okay, from this thing to this thing, I'm allowing these things. And it allows me to visualize this in a number of different ways where I can see, you know, where, how my users are actually coming in, uh, what are my communications with my shared services environments, um, you know, how many systems do I actually have that are providing me with DNS, things of that nature. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to kick off a scan. This is an in-map scanner that we have in our environment that is going to show me all of the systems that I have that are running on this uh, application. So. If I go look at things like uh, the application servers that I have listed in here, I've got three application servers. <clears throat> so when we go back over to our MAP system, we should see that we've got eight VMs that are running, and it'll show me all of the uh, components that are exposed on these. So we've actually got you know a number of different things like uh, you know here's a server that's you know running well it's actually running in Nginx and Apache, which is you know interesting. Maybe that was an accident. Uh, we've actually got multiple ports open. But if I go over to my application and log in, you'll see we've got a functional application that I can you know kind of jump in and you know get through. However, as you remember, I looked at that uh, that system over there, number 33. If I go look at this and I hit port 8080, okay, that's actually just a, another redirect interface for the application. Okay, so is that one? All right, oops. Uh, what about port 80? Oh, okay, so now I can actually see, I've enumerated at least a little bit of information about what that is uh, running. 
So, you know, again, I, I don't have any protection mechanism for uh, this stuff. The, uh, the other thing that I have is I've also got the ability to uh, SSH uh, over to this. This is the same system. Uh, so I can you know, do pretty much anything that I want to connected to that, that system. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to switch over. Oops, that was an accident. So I'm just going to switch over internal and enforcement. So one of the things that uh, this does is it automatically will manage our uh, policy for us across any number of workloads. So one thing to note is I, I showed earlier is that we have a, you know, a set of uh, uh, application nodes within a cluster. One of the things that we have the ability to see is things like what's actually running on these systems. So you can actually see, you know, this is the system that I was uh, running, uh, that, I, that I'm uh, testing out. I can see I've got Nginx running on here. I can dig in and see a little bit of data behind what's running on that port. Uh, and I can also see things like, have I ever seen any traffic coming in and out of this port? Uh, so I have the ability to kind of enumerate some of that information. And if I go back and look at something, here, this is the tag metadata that I was talking about. This is something that in our lab, we actually have, um, it basically it's a part of our uh, deployment uh, automation that we tag things in uh, like info blocks. We can take this stuff and actually pull it in automatically into Tetration through a set of integrations that help us understand if I scale this application up or down, my workload count would go up or down with that. So uh, I, I actually turned on our enforcement. It takes about a minute's worth of time for that to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go run a quick scan again and see if I still have the same level of exposure on those systems. While that's running, I'll switch back over and verify if my application is still running. It actually is. I may not have talked long enough for the rule set to push. <clears throat> If I didn't, then I'll just kick it off again. Nope, not long enough. Okay, so while I'm waiting for this to run, I'm going to look at a couple of the questions. All right, so, okay, real quick, you can see my MAP scanner has found that basically those same assets are not available anymore. My application is still functional, but if I go over and try to hit this application on the non-standard ports, one of the things that you'll see is this will just kind of spin for quite a while and I will not be able to get into it. If I go back to my SSH session, I am no longer able to, to get to that. I've got another system, if you want to kind of talk about um, uh, uh, lateral, uh, lateral movement, this is one of my test environments where I should be able to uh, SSH from one system to the other. This is, again, behind any firewalls and actually sits on the exact same VLAN. So it's, you know, the, you know, the exact same IP range. So this, this is 172.17.17.33. This is 17.29. So same VLAN and, you know, all the networking is just very basic and normal. So what I've done is very simply learned about what my application is doing to create a whitelist and just turn on enforcement. So that's just a very quick demo. I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but uh, I do want to jump over and see if we've got any questions. All right, so a couple of questions. Um, Ajit says, what is the deployment architecture in a hybrid environment on-prem and on the cloud? Uh, so the deployment architecture can be a couple of different things. One of them is uh, either a big data cluster that gets deployed on-prem or a cloud-based service that runs uh, in the Cisco uh, uh, on Cisco uh, cloud uh, in a Cisco cloud property, uh, where you actually have the cloud environment. Uh, that is something where essentially all you do is install an agent, and it communicates communicates back with the cluster. Uh, if you deploy a, a, a cluster on-prem, obviously that cluster becomes the cluster that your agents would report to. So that's really kind of what the deployment looks like as far as how we do enforcement. What we're doing is once we learn the rules that need to be enforced and you hit the enforce button, that would actually push the policies to the agent. The agent then programs the local controls on whatever that operating system is and it enforces those. So what you saw in that demo was me taking the rule set that we discovered, enforcing that by pushing the rules down to that VM and then it programmed IP tables on a Linux box. So hopefully that answered the question. 
Uh, let's see, another one. Difference between app dynamics and tetration usage perspective. Okay, uh, so that's a good question. Uh, app dynamics is really a system that is built almost exclusively for understanding application performance and application performance management, whereas tetration is a system that's built specifically for segmentation uh, of the communications between application instance nodes. So it's really a just kind of a, a difference between app performance versus app, uh, app security. Uh, let's see, what is the discovery interval to determine the dependency mapping? Um, so the discovery interval just depends on the application itself. Uh, you actually can get useful data within minutes. However, uh, it could very likely uh, be something where you may need to watch the data over a while, especially if you've got applications that happen to have seasonal data that live on the border of um, you know, maybe a, a month end or a quarter end or a fiscal year end or something like that. If you want to make sure that you're capturing enough right data, you want to be able to capture as much data for as long as possible. So as an example, I'll show you, uh, now again, this is our lab environment where it's not necessarily the same as a production system, but you can actually see that, that uh, I've actually got data in my system that goes back almost a year. So this gives us the ability to actually grab uh, data from our system for a very long time. So you know, we can go back to a, a, a very uh, long set of detail and actually that's, that's actually within that particular application. So I have data that goes back to you know uh, last April within this system. So we have the ability to model data against a large data set uh, that we can use pretty much you know uh, however we need to. Um, so Carol, uh, I think that's actually it for the questions in the question panel. Um, so I will hand it back over to you uh, for the wrap up. All right, thank you so much, Loy, for your great presentation, and to Cisco for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.